So Rich and I spent time this weekend getting our um, breeding groups organized. So this is, rep all the cards represent the sheep and the flock. Each sheep has a card. And I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven pens that we're going to be managing. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven pens. Um, two of them are not breeding pens. So this one has got four ram lambs that we're going to overwinter. And this little red text tag here is where we're going to keep them. One of the constraints that we have with breeding is we need to have spaces for all these different groups. They can't share a fence line because there is breeding across. You can They can breed through uh, mesh fencing. And there has to be enough space in the pens for it to be healthy because they're going to be in there for like a month and a week for the, to hit two cycles, maybe even a little bit more. So the groups are, like I said, this is the ram lambs that we're overwintering. These are lambs and then ewes that are retired. So we've got three older ewes here that we're not going to be breeding. I said in my last video that we were going to breed blue sapphire, but we're not. So those are the three, the three nursing home ladies, and then those are all my ewe lambs that are going to be staying in the barn. The four ram lambs are going to be in that dog chain pen, where the one that I wrecked the door and Rich fixed it. Then we've got the white ram lamb. He's going to get four ewes. We've got a black ram. He's in the yearling pen right now. He's going to get a good number of ewes. Nightly, he's got a good group. So Knightley is going to be in one of the pens that the yearling ram is in now. He's probably going to take over where uh, Locola and Rosemary are. And then the adult ram pen, which is uh, pretty much a lean-to with a very large space, pasture space. That's John Snow's group. He's the great cat mugget. And then I'm going to use a small wood travel crate that we have for um, this smaller group of four ewes, and they're actually smaller sized ewes as well. So, um, so that's the way it looks. Another piece of data that I use to help us make the breeding groups is I put, um, for each ram, I'll put the, their sire and their dam and then their grandparents. And one of our restrictions, another constraint, is that we don't want to breed sheep that are related closely. And so the closest relationship we allow is if they share a grand so I use that as the guide, and then I just can, you know, I read. So here's Sif, for example. She's out of Mrs. Patmore, who um, is out of Canterbury and Turin, and then Rush. So the nice thing about bringing sheep in, Rush is a ram that we bought, is that there's very low likelihood of there being relationships. So because she's out of Canterbury and Turin, her, her grandparents, there's no crossover there. And that was, that's a really important criteria for how we broke out the breeding groups this year. It was pretty much the main um, criteria, just because at this point in our breeding program, I mean, everybody's, we're really happy with everything. We're happy with our fiber quality, um, the fiber length. There's really not a ton of improving that we want to do this year. So... And then it's also likely that we won't breed all of these ewes. So what we'll do is when it comes time to put the groups together, we'll get weights and do an evaluation, make sure that they're in a good shape to, to be able to breed. And, um, and then we'll go from there. But this, this is how it's laid out. We use the laptop with the Excel spreadsheet also that's got data in it. We use the NASA website that's got pedigree and stuff in it. And here's one of the spreadsheet outputs I created that has the sheep, their sire, their dam, and their maternal and paternal grand sire and dam. And 
it's just it's a you know tool that we use to help us make sure we set up the correct groups so it's pretty exciting and it's gonna I mean we're gonna be setting them up pretty soon we usually do it over the Thanksgiving weekend which is next weekend so this is sort of the start of it Hi everybody, welcome to my wool cave. This is where I do all of my fiber crafting. It's actually the basement of our house. I took over about half of the basement and uh, just sort of set up a little cave studio. Anyways, um, just wanted to say hello and thank you for joining me today. Thank you everybody that is subscribing to the channel. I have a goal of getting to a thousand subscribers. I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but there are benefits to YouTubers that get to a thousand uh, subscribers. So if you've been watching and just haven't made the time, I would really appreciate it if you could subscribe and help me achieve that goal. Hope everybody's doing well. I know these are crazy times and uh, everybody's staying healthy. Um, Thanksgiving is next week. We are gonna stay home and we've encouraged my son not to come home uh, with his girlfriend. So it's, going to be really hard, but you know what I said is if I can miss Rhinebeck, <laughs> you know, the rest of this stuff is uh, great. Me. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin off a stylus for the first time. So Magicraft offers a stylus kit and you can put it on your Magicraft wheel. It works on all the different wheels and it's supposed to duplicate the effects of spinning with a drop spindle and also long draw. I watched one video quite a while ago on the stylus. I don't really remember very much about it, so I'm really just sort of starting fresh and actually relying quite a bit on the instructions. So this is the stylus kit. This is how it comes in this little Ziploc bag, very simple, Magicraft, they're a very hands-on outfit. Not a lot of automation, everything is very personalized. So they just wrote on there with a Sharpie, a stylus kit. There is a one sheet, an instruction sheet. This is also up on the web. And um, I haven't read the instructions yet, but here it says, the first type of spinning wheel was the quill or spindle wheel. The Magicraft stylus is a polished aluminum quill or spindle that screws straight onto the flyer shaft. A small bobbin is part of the set and is placed on the shaft first with the stylus snug against it. Make sure the stylus is done up quite tightly so that it doesn't come undone when working. You can treadle it on and off just as with your flyer. The stylus attachment will fit all Magicraft spinning wheels. So, I'm going to take this off. Because we're not going to need a flyer. I'm going to remove that. I'm going to remove this bobbin that's got some bits and scraps on it. So it doesn't really tell us here how to install the stylus kit, which is kind of an issue. I know there's a little, a little washer that comes, comes with it. So here's the locking washer, I think that's called. So there's one piece. And then this is the stylus. hole in the side so this is you put that on there I guess and then it comes with two stylus bobbins we're only going to use one Duh. <laughs> we're, um, and the stylus bobbin it's got grooves on one side to guide I think that's where you put your fiber and then there's a brake band groove. So that's what goes up against your head. And I am going to pause right here and see if I can find instructions on how to install the stylus so that I don't do it incorrectly. I'm going to pause this for a second. True to form, there's nothing in there that tells you where the washer should be installed. I have no idea. I'm 
gonna try it without it, see what happens. So you don't use the brake band. Just install the bobbin. for my leader. Okay, the wool I'm going to use is um, from quite a while ago. Some roving I had made. And acorn fiber works from a U. Her name is Kaya. We don't have her any longer. I can't even remember if I sold her or what, whatever. But it, it, she's old enough that I, I don't even remember what the naming convention was that we used for her. This is what I'm going to use, and it should be fine because, according to the Magic Craft materials, the stylus kit is designed for finer spinning, long draw, you know, cotton and everything. Now, what they also say in the manual do say is you're going to want to use the faster whirl, so I'm going to go on the very last one and see how that goes. I'm not going to put the high speed whirl on just because I don't want to deal with that. It's not really that difficult to do, but so I'm going to also tighten up my head so that the band is a little bit more taut. I just started treadling and it just kind of wound on the thing. Quill. It's really pulling hard. I'm going to, um, while I'm just experimenting, I'm going to go up a couple notches. And then after, they say after you become a little bit more proficient that you can go to the higher wall. Higher pulley. Groove. like snapping off on the tip.
Leader yarn is attached to the bobbin, brought over the end of the bobbin, and out to the point of the stylus. It is turns that the yarn will slip into the groove, which stabilizes the pole. You get a free spinning sliver. Traveling Metacraft and the usual to hold the leader yarn out to one side at a suggested angle of between 30 and 60 degrees, with an optimum of around 45. And laying the handle over to one side will give you a better angle. Attach yourself to the long draw. Hold it long enough to continue to twist this in the yarn. I could take more twists than you might expect to start. When it is how you want it, reverse the wheel a little to unwind the yarn from the stylus, and then holding the yarn at right angles to the bobbin pebble, you should wind it on the bobbin. Okay, so that's it. So you're, it doesn't automatically wind it. You have to do that by hand. Gotcha. I'm trying to think back in school. This is 90 degrees, so this would be 45. to um, be vending in the Woolen Fiber Artists Virtual Festival. So that's all next weekend. They do 30 minute segments each vendor. And during your 30 minutes, apparently I've never done it before, it's almost like you're doing a whole shopping network deal. You do a live feed on Facebook and then people purchase your stuff right in the comments. They just say, I want to buy that. Part of it, you yeah, I want you to do like little promotional stuff throughout the week, training, educating, community building stuff. And I'm gonna do this. I'm going to do a one plus every day until 
until Sunday, Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So for my UK friends, that's, is it 8 or 9? I don't know, it's daylight savings time here, so I'm not sure how that screws with everything. And uh, so it'd be really awesome if if you guys wanted to. It's 30 minutes and it'll be a live feed and I you know I think it'd be really fun. I've never done live feed before and part of my issue with that is of course my internet connection. But I'm gonna do it and uh, it'd be really fun if some, some of you had the time and you could just stop in and say hello. I think you have to join the WAFA group to be able to view the presentations that people do and stuff. It'd be great though to just have a chance to chat with you all if you're Okay, so all that time I thought I had my new microphone hooked up, which I didn't. So hopefully I was, you could hear me. I'm gonna, is that right? Yeah, so I'm gonna do some um, more research. I got a couple questions. One is why is there a brake band groove in the bobbin if you're not gonna use the brake band? And number two is it's supposed to make that click, click, click sound. I don't know if you can hear it, the microphone going. But um, it doesn't seem right. I can see it getting a rhythm. It's really letting me spin this long draw really crazy consistent. So it's supposed to, it, sa it says it gives it a really high degree of twist, which lets you do really fine yarns and stuff. It's never really been a dream of mine to do fine yarns, but and also that you can do them really fast, I guess. Does anybody out there use the stylus kit? So the kit comes with two bobbins. put on your lazy cake and um, fly onto a standard bobbin. So this is what Beauty and the Beast pricked her finger on. Not Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty. Good morning. <coughs> Alright, so I've been fretting and stewing about how to get this thing to work. I did a instant message to Magic Craft last night and they answered me really fast with some of my questions. So the one question I had was, you know, the stylus kit comes with this little washer and it, when you watch the video, the Magic Craft video, where they're doing this on an aura, they actually use the washer. They don't use it when they put it on the Susie. It's another video that they had. So when I emailed them, they said that you use the washer on the aura because apparently there's some sort of a gap. Um, so you would use the washer on the aura. The um, other thing that I learned was that if you remember, I didn't want to put it on the high speed pulley ratio, but one thing I learned was the fact that it's not taking it up is part of the reason why you can use such a high ratio. You're not actually supposed to be pulling against the tip of the stylus, which is what I was doing. I was doing an unsupported long draw and it was putting pressure on the tip and making it kind of do a snapping noise. So what it 
what it, it's actually supposed to be doing here is putting a significant amount of twist into the leader for you so that you have you can you know create a really thin yarn without it pulling on it and so it's more about you know getting a good amount of twist this is really just putting twist in your fiber without the tension and that is why you can do such a fine single so I guess this is called supported long draw I don't know I don't know the words to stuff the um so yeah I'm just it gives you a lot more time to build up the twist it's not pulling I think that's the, the benefit of the stylus kit, and that's why you can get to a lot thinner yarns, which is really not my forte, but that's, I'm sort of getting the premise of the purpose of the stylus kit. It's more like a drop spindle where you're not getting that pull, and so you can kind of build up a lot more twist, get it a lot thinner. Because it's not pulling on me right now. And a little bit more twist in it. So I'm gonna try an aerial shot of this, but there's a piece of my hair in there, I can feel it going through. <laughs> well. Okay, so there's even twist still that I'm I'm putting too much twist in it, I think. So I get it now, it's really cool. I mean, it's a totally different way of looking at it. It gives you the ability to use your wheel. And the angle is also important because it seems like it's getting more twist when it's at that. Another thing is you really do want to make sure that you get, you have enough leader to, to kind of span the entire length of the quill and give you a little extra for drafting. Yeah, I think this is pretty cool. It's a totally different feel, which I'm going to say that it's kind of exciting to be able to use your wheel in different ways and try different things. So I'm going to keep working at this. I'm going to fill up two bobbins and ply it and um, it'll take me a little while here. But hopefully by then I'll become much more proficient at it. But at least I understand a little bit better the principle and the purpose of you know, what it's... You don't really have to set it in the groove. I mean, as, as you twist it, it does it. <clears throat> the old bobbins that went with the stylus only have one groove, so I'm imagining they added all these grooves so that it will catch no matter where you are in the placement of the bobbin. And I think I might have said this already, but I totally get why you would want to use your faster whirl. And to eliminate the snap snapping, it, you just, you know, with this hand, make it so there's not as much pressure against the tip of the quill. Back pedal just a tiny bit to wind it on. Give myself enough leader. The other thing I like about this is that because I always would do short 
forward draw. My hand's starting to get sore from that repetitive motion. So it's nice to have different ways to configure your hands to achieve yarn. Hi everybody, I'm here with Jean Dukershine and I invited her onto the channel because she's doing a lot of really interesting things with uh, natural dyes. And I get a lot of questions from people about how well does the fine Shetland wool take to dyeing. And so I thought I'd bring on Jean to kind of talk us through some of her experiences and techniques that she's using as a very experienced uh, dyer particularly natural dyes. So welcome, Jean. Thanks for being on the on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Good. So I guess what I'd like to start with is if you could just tell us your origin story, how you got into the sheep and, you know, just kind of okay. how it all started. It all started when my mother bought an antique Wells single drive, a double drive single treadle Wells wheel before I was born. Um, and had it in the house when we were growing up and nobody knew how to spin on it, but we played with it a lot and got familiar with it. It was a working wheel with all the bands and everything in place. And, and um, so when I always had wanted to spin but could never find a teacher and that's a lot of people were like that back then. Um, and so about when I was in my 40s sometime, my son was out of college and had his first job in Texas and we went down on the plane from Minneapolis to see him and there was a woman knitting a few rows ahead of me and the stewardess came along and said, and I was knitting too, and she said, what are you knitting? And the minute the other woman heard knitting, her head whips around and looks at me, you know, and then she said, let's, let's try and switch seats so we can sit together and knit together on the whole flight, you know? <laughs> so, and so, and then we started talking about, I found out Renee hand spun most of her yarn and I was fascinated. I said, where did you learn and where can I learn? I live, you know, two hours, two and a half hours south of you. Do you know anyone in this area who knows how to spin that I could learn from? And she said, yes. And um, she also said Shetland sheep would be a really good sheep to start with because their wool is, is premier hand spinning wool and it's easy to spin. And, and this woman happens to have Shetland sheep too. And she gave me the name. It took me about a year to find Nancy. <laughs> And finally, when I found her, we got together and had a lot of fun. And I ended up buying our first block of sheep from her, too. So, um, and one of them, Godiva, turned out to be fine fleece. That's what I knew I wanted. And so I was looking to find the finest one she had. And we brought them up here to our farm when we retired in northern Wisconsin. And so now we raise and breed Shetland sheep and we have the wool. And I spin, knit, crochet once in a while, weave, but not very often. Um, and so, and felt, I felt quite a bit. So it, it, mm -hmm. the fine Shetland felts quite well relative to the coarser Shetlands. Um, and the undercoats of the double coated felt well too, but they're hard to separate out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I've gotten that feedback from a, a customer that bought a fleece from me who was a very passionate felter and she was mm -hmm. really happy with the results she, yeah. she kind of wrote a really yeah. long piece about it and ravelry and stuff but so wow. um yeah so for the fine flea shetland so you're you're breeding now for fine flea shetlands you're yes, part of the, same as you are the right yeah yep. yep. um so can you talk a little bit about the fine wool dyeing the fine wool and what special considerations or techniques you have to use um with dyeing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um even fine Shetlands, you know, have a gradation of how fine the wool is based on the body part and the finest is the neck. And on the necks, I am a little more careful with, I try to use um, weaker concentrations of, of, you know, dye or, or the chemicals that go with it. The chemicals that go with it, usually with natural dyeing, they're not that harsh, but there are a few like 
ammonia where you're changing the pH. If you change it too much, it might be a little more fragile on the neck wool, but I haven't really had any trouble. It takes color well. There's mm -hmm. many interesting colors to over dye that create very interesting results, both with natural and commercial acid dyes. So, so I think it dyes well. And of course, different animals dye differently among sheep, but also goats, mohair dyes differently. And, yeah so. yeah. so what's the failure <laughs> mode if you you know if your chemicals cause issues like how how is it a pro what what is it how oh, does it manifest well, itself well they can it, it's kind of dull and brittle and may become tender may, may break more easily after it's dyed so that when you're knitting the yarn won't be as strong and the texture won't be quite as it'll be dull and a little bit rougher harsher feeling um it's like when a person over bleaches their hair. Okay, all right. Really similar to that, or if you've been in the swimming pool all summer and your hair turns green, it's kind of like that. <laughs> okay. So you can tell pretty fast, I mean. Oh, you know. okay. And I have had okay. really not much of that. It was only when I was first starting, usually, and so. Now, okay. Be careful. And the other failure mode is because Vine Shetland belts easier than regular many other wools it it can felt if you change temperature fast while you're dying so you have to be careful about that not as careful as with a fiber like alpaca that felts really easily but somewhat careful i see okay okay all right very helpful all right so can you talk a little bit you got into it somewhat the natural colors of the shetland wool and how those play with dyes and some of your experiments and things you okay done. many of the patterned shetlands are what they call um a goody that there's a fading effect on the main blanket fleece of the body and they may have colored points like a siamese cat and the, i love those goody those lighter blankets on the sheep because they over dye very well they'll have a little bit of under color that makes the color softer but they'll they'll really um, show the color as well because they're fairly light fleeces. And the morts, the browns, any brown like a fawn is a variation of morit that's a little grayer. And then the morit is the regular red brown or golden brown. Those over dye fantastically because, and they actually change the color. Like if you dye a brown with um, a lighter golden brown with a with a regular bright green, it turns into forest green on, on the brown, over the brown, and, and oh, red turns, oh. bright red like tomato red turns into burgundy, and those are acid dyes that I mainly, commercial dyes I experimented with to see that, but it makes really beautiful colors, um, and, and it's kind of a surprise, it's kind of fun, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the cool. whites, of course, if you want really clear colors, you use a really clear white. And, there are more creamy whites, like a, a Goody Muscat Shetland. That's what they, that will be a creamy white as an adult, but it's a very light brown as a lamb. So it changes over the time, over its lifespan, and it creates yeah, different saying, results. Yeah. You, you were saying that it kind of looks like a mushroom? Yeah, and I have, this is a little bit of a felted cruelty free pelt. Uh, that's kind of the color. That's probably a two-year-old I would say or a three-year-old and it's darker on the back because that was from a lamb so um, it changes color as it grows up and becomes this color pretty much um, with a it's a it's got a little gray in it and it's got a little brown in it and it's creamy so so that's how a muscat looks and they really over dye nicely because they warm up the colors a little bit and it's counter it's black based counterpart is in a goody gray and we just call it a gray or an agouti gray, and it doesn't have a special name like muscat. And they cool down the colors when you over dye, and they're fun to use too, especially with blues and greens. So. And you were saying that you don't get to play with gray as much because your fleeces sell so rapidly. Yeah, the gray, gray fleeces, to, <laughs> and the, also the breeding rams and the ewes sell really fast too because people love them. They're really they're pretty. Yeah. Cheap. Yeah. yeah. Gray fleeces. I'm very partial to gray myself, so. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that kind of gave me the inspiration for having this conversation and recording it was I was following you. I follow you on Instagram and your Instagram feed, you really share a lot of images of, you know, experimenting with the dyes and it's mostly natural dye. So it seems mm -hmm. like you're more of a natural mm -hmm. focus. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just really fun to watch. Like, you know, you 
the thing that kills me about it is it seems like you many times you're not really sure what you're going to get. So, <laughs> so I just wondered if you could talk about that and like, you know, just kind of what your attitude has to be going in and, you know, well, that's the fun part. And, you know, yeah. I have some really good books that have excellent um, directions that are very clear. And if I use those, it's more predictable. And I usually do use them, but sometimes I'll modify it to play. And if you go into it with I usually go into natural dying with a fairly playful attitude because sometimes it just, oh wow, it exceeds your expectations. <laughs> and other times it's kind of like, oh, how did this happen? You know? <laughs> so, and then you have to go back and figure out what you did wrong or maybe your concentration of, of wool relative to water and relative to dye stuff wasn't correct. But usually that's what it is, is the dye is too weak because you had too much water or too much wool, but but there can be other things too. Um, it's a little hard to predict when you're using a new plant. So, I mean, Black Eyed Susan looked like it would produce a really nice green and all I got was this really blah, hardly there, grayish brownish color and it was a lot of work and I hated it and I said, I'm never using Black Eyed Susan really? again, which I probably should try again. It probably wasn't concentrated enough or boiled long enough. Sunflowers and Black Eyed Susans, you have to boil a long time or simmer a long time before you even put the wool in to extract the dye from the plant. So, so various plants will differ quite a bit. What color and were you expecting with the black eyes? I wanted a, a dark green, like an olive green, a dark olive green, and sunflowers will make the same color. I don't know if it's the same dye as sunflowers are a little easier, but you have to mordant those with copper, and I don't like to use toxic mordants. I usually just use alum, because I know I can pour it out and it'll be fine and it won't hurt my septic tank or my soil or anything. So. Um, copper sulfate is more toxic, especially for sheep. <laughs> they get yeah, too much yeah. in their grass, you know, or something. So yeah. I, I usually just boil copper plumbing pipe with it during the dyeing process with a little extra acid, and that will do a little bit of a greenish cast, but it doesn't do too much. So it's not the nice dark olive green. So I'm still working on that one. It's, it's the greens are kind of challenging. So <laughs> wow. Usually so I use blend know. colors to get greens more so. so. Do you have a dye garden? I do, yeah. Yeah, I, I scatter it around different places and I have a great big garden for vegetables and I tuck in the dye plants. And, and then I have big tractor tires that I grow my Japanese indigo in because some of the dye plants are a little invasive and you want to keep them kind of contained and those are those tractor tires are like raised beds and it doesn't spread much from there so mm. yeah. <laughs> so I probably will put it in the garden though some year because I need more for the dry leaf fermentation the traditional sukumo Japanese fermentation bats you need a lot of leaves for that so mm. So you have some stuff in the book behind you there. I wondered if you could do a little show yes. and tell. And yeah, sure. Um, where do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about indigo. You can also do some really simple things with indigo leaves. You can pound prints on the fabric, and it's a permanent dye. You don't need a mordant. Um, so this is a white bandana that I dyed with avocado to kind of tone down the white, and then I pounded a bunch of indigo leaves this morning if you pick them first thing in the morning they make more color i think that has something to do with the plant being overnight resting or something and storing some things that are needed for the color um and you can do all kinds of you know like little little birds on a face mask or, uh. or little um butterflies you know you can do fun things with it or big rosettes of radiating leaves it's really fun and it's simple. I've done it with kids in workshops with other flowers, not with indigo, because I haven't done it at the right time of year for that. But I have plants indoors now that I saved in my greenhouse and dug from the outdoor bed, you know. So, so, so I can do this anytime. Yep, that's Japanese indigo. And I'm I'm making some seeds on it too. I don't know if you, they're kind of small, but I, I raised the seeds because it's hard to find the seeds. They're kind of, they only last a couple of years. I refrigerate them. If I refrigerate them, they last two years, but some people only get one year and then they go bad, you know, so. Uh-huh. Is it, is it a go perennial? <laughs> no, it's a, here it's an annual because we live in Northern Wisconsin. Um, in Japan, I think even they plant it as an annual and just harvest it, so. But it's related to the smart weeds and they kind of just come up on their own every year and it would too if we let it go. <laughs> 
it's, it's pretty, it's frost tender, but it, there's so many seeds that some of them survive and come up at the right time. So, huh. neat. Yeah. All right. What else you got back there? Okay. We've got, I did a lot of Coreopsis this year. And I love this Coreopsis one. This is the brilliant, the orange that you can get if you have a strong dye bath and boil it quite a long time and make it fairly concentrated. And then this is compared to the dark indigo you can get. So I love those two colors together because yeah, they're kind of nice. Yeah. Um, and then Coreopsis in weaker dye baths makes more of a gold. Um, like I have some lacks here that are both gold and orange, so you can see the difference. Like if, at the beginning of the season, the plants are younger and they haven't made so much dye. And when you get impatient and pick the flowers, then you get, and you don't have as many flowers, you know, because it's early in the season, you get this pretty light gold yellow. And then later on, you start getting these oranges when you include the seeds and the flowers and everything. So that is so cool. Uh, yeah, it's fun. And then I have, sometimes I'll do like two different marigold and coreopsis and at the end I'll have these exhausts that I throw together and just make assorted yellows from them, <laughs> you know, because they'll what die together. What does exhaust, exhaust mean? It's like after you do the very first original dye bath, there's still some color left in it and you yeah. put yarn in and you get lighter colors then. But if you mix them together, you get an interesting little mix of yeah. both colors. And I do that also with indigo has Japanese indigo, when you boil it, first you extract the blue, the indus, and then you extract the yellow with higher heat. So you can, it's a two-step plant. It gives you two different colors. It gives you both blue in the first step and yellow in the second step. So that's a really nice plant to grow because you get two colors for one plant. Yeah. So, yeah. So can you talk about the, uh, what, how, what kind of wool you like to dye with? you? You know, are you dyeing mm -hmm. millspun yarn? Are you dyeing roving? You know, oh, raw. The form of the wool. The yeah. best ones to, the easiest ones to use that prevent felting more are the locks and the millspun or hand spun yarn. Um, in the intermediate stages when it's carded, it felts a little more easily. You can do it, but you have to be more careful. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you felting. Huh? You I, wash the locks before? Oh, yeah, you have to wash. All my wool that I wash here, I do at least two washes with a pH neutral detergent. And then I um, soak it in a professional um, dyers or fabric detergent that I get from Dharma Trading Company right before, because even just to be sure all the oils are out, it creates more of an even dye. And I leave, I actually leave the detergent right in the yarn when I dye it. And then I, um, rinse well afterwards so you're in effect kind of giving the yarn a weak wash at the end to all in one step because it still has some detergent in the dye pot so that works pretty well for me mm -hmm. i imagine you've experimented with different things oh, yeah. right you landed because yeah. <laughs> you have to be careful with the detergent if it's not ph neutral it might change the color so i mean you know that from washing wool it affects the wool in lots of different ways so mm -hmm. I know you're so, careful too. Yeah, I'll put a link on the. Maybe you can share with me the name of the Dharma detergent that you use that we can. Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's their house brand, and it's a little less expensive. Synthropol is the professional name of the other brand. It's not their house brand. Both of them are practically the same thing, but I just buy the house brand. Okay, so let's talk about your background as a scientist. Um, and I, I guess I just want to hear you talk a little bit about how you approach dyeing or how that's informed this hobby of yours. And, you know, as you're talking with other mm -hmm. dyers, you know, are, are, you know, you got kind of a unique perspective, I guess. Um, yeah, when, when I came through college, I had to have almost a major in chemistry to do the medical laboratory, the medical technologist degree. So, um, so I learned we have a lot of color reactions in medical technology when we're diagnosing or determining blood concentrations in people of various substances that can be in the blood and, and a lot of color reactions and the endpoints are pretty have to be pretty sensitive because you're working with this tiny amount of material in the blood and then you have to have 
arranged within the color so that you can actually make a graph and determine a calibration graph and determine what the concentration is. So basically I learned that um, big, you know, sensitive dyes, color changes can occur pretty fast at very small concentrations with the right range and the right chemical. And that's what they're using when they use all this natural dyeing stuff. You have to kind of find a range to work in. And if you follow directions in books, that helps a lot because <laughs> they've already <laughs> done all that work. Yeah. <laughs> My two favorite books are A Dyer's Garden by Rita Buchanan. That one's actually out of print right now and it's hard to find, but it's really a good, it's just a little book and it's really, really good, well-written, clear directions. Um, she talks about the unpredictability. She's very honest about it. <laughs> You know, your, the hardness of your water affects it too, you know, and so, and the amount of iron in the water. And my other one is one is a new book, Soulful Dying for All Eternity, Singing the Blues. Who wouldn't want to buy a book with that title? It's kind of pricey, <laughs> but I asked for it for Christmas. And it's by John Marshall, and he has actually spent many years in Japan with the world famous Japanese indigo artists doing all kinds of different work. But he goes through almost every technique you can use with indigo, except for the yellow form. He doesn't, that's called the white indigo. He doesn't, or the, not the, no, that's different. I'm sorry, the yellow form that you boil. He doesn't talk much about that, but see, he makes these very intricate leaf prints. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. But, yeah, and big ones, you know, that are just gorgeous. And so I'm just, a, doing baby steps here you know but he's a real artist <laughs> so, something wow and he's also very good on his technical information he does a remarkable combination of both so mm -hmm. it's worth the money it's about fifty dollars but it's worth the money um and then if you die a lot with indigo anyway it is you know but even as a book it's fun to read so yeah, yeah. Um, and then i've got avocado we didn't this shirt here that i'm wearing i'm going to make into an all-season shirt that's one of our principles in fiber shed is that we wear our clothes as long and as much as we can before we buy new ones and we use this is not i don't know if this is a sustainable fiber but some fibers are just more sustainable to produce than others are and and there's ways to do it and ways not to do it and cotton's pretty bad actually but unless you mm. grow and it cotton, but um, this is my wool from a Muska Shetland over dyed with Haas avocado dye, I think. And um, the first bath is pinker. These are just, um, what do you call them, Rolox that I did on hand carters. And I want a nice fluffy wool and I'm gonna use that because it has some of these colors here in this shirt. And then I'm gonna pull more brown Shetland and gray Shetland and just make a cowl that works with this and then make some oh. um, make some fingerless gauntlets, you know, that come up so uh -huh. I can pinterize uh -huh. it kind of <laughs> wear it more seasonal. Right. So. Oh, that's so cool. So for that, um, the avocado dyed wool, you dyed those locks and then you carded it into roll eggs yeah. or that's yeah, okay. what I do. Yeah. And then yep. I actually took some of it through hand spinning when I was first doing it. I I hand spun these and these are not as brilliant in color because I was just learning and I hadn't found my concentrations yet. For those that this really pink one, this is the first bath, so it's the darkest bath. The dye solution was red because has avocados, they're the ones that have the reddish skins and, and you use the pits and the skins and everything. And I, I collected them all winter long and I boiled them once a week because that's how you extract the color every time you put a new one in. You, so I tried to eat an avocado at least once a week because if you let go too long, it gets moldy. So, so I just kept it going all winter and made a really concentrated uh, extract and strained it and then I froze it and it sat in my freezer for about three years before I finally got to it and this fall I we were cleaning the freezer and Russ said either it gets thrown away or you do something <laughs> with it. So, so I just did it you know and it oh, was, I'm so it glad was you did it it's so bad. pretty I'm glad I did it too because I, I the, it can get quite beige like this sometimes if you overheat it it turns brown but it also, this is a more of an, my water is kind of acidic here, so I have to use an alkaline diff to get those really pink pinks and stuff. So, yeah. 
So it's There's so much to consider. It's just, it took, it's, yeah, it took a long time to figure out avocados, but they're pretty nice when you do. Yeah, there is a lot. Boy, oh boy. It's like every thing you say, I come up with 20 more questions to ask you about it there's so much there to learn it's just amazing and i learned my avocado dyeing from a young lady who was only 17 years old she was homeschooled and she was very very artistic she still is i'm sure she has an etsy store and a website but that was down in southeast minnesota so i haven't talked to her for a while but she was a wonderful young lady she gave me the seeds and she gave me the directions Wow. And now there's wow. stuff out on the web, too. So her name's yeah. Hannah, and I can't remember. She's probably married, so her last name's probably not the same now anyway. But oh. <laughs> That's so great. Everybody shares, yeah. And the ladies in fiber shed, there's a fiber shed movement across the country, like a watershed, only it's for fiber. And it's, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah sustainable, organic, regenerative farming methods, um, and only natural dyeing is allowed for the product. And, and then the fiber is grown on the farm, of course, and you're marketing it locally, so you're not requiring a lot of shipping, extra fuel and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, that they're they're springing up all over the country. Usually, the radius is about 175 to 200 miles. So to, you could be 400 miles. It depends on the number of producers in the area. With more producers, they concentrate down, and they're sm <coughs> smaller in geography. But <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> ours is 175 miles <coughs> from the Twin Cities, so I qualify for it. And the only reason I'm not a formal member, I've been affiliated for many years and I'm friends with many of the people, but they don't allow you to use any commercial acid dyes. And I kind of oh. like those once in a while. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We try to be to sustainable, be, but with everything Do you else. have to be certified organic? <laughs> you just have to be willing to learn and to use it. and. I've never actually applied to see. I am not certified organic here, but we use a lot of organic methods. They give you a yeah. Yeah. they give you a questionnaire at the beginning. So the reason I'm not is because we have to use herbicides under the electric fences and a few other places. But I don't use any pesticides or any of that. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, gee, this was just amazing. I appreciate you so much taking the time to share your knowledge and experience and um you know using dyes with the soft shetland wool that's really really interesting so um just thanks and and we are going to put a bunch of links you have a lot more okay. information you want to share right, right? So we'll link right. that up in yeah. the in the notes and then yeah. i will ask you i'll show you how to do this but i may get some comments and questions from some of my mm -hmm. viewers and subscribers mm -hmm. and um maybe if you can offer to answer any questions anybody might have in the comments later on you'd be more than sure, happy sure okay. is there a way to link it up to email or any of that where i would see that somebody has a question so i could go check or is there uh, a way, I think to, have a way to alert you yeah okay okay that. that would be so, good yeah yeah, yeah. Well, okay. thank you again. I appreciate you're, it. <laughs> you're very welcome. It was fun. Yeah.